Chapter 20, Section 4, The Republican Boom Years. Under the economic policies of the Republican presidents, the post-World War I recession faded away. Businesses began to expand. Productivity increased dramatically. Unemployment dropped and wages rose to double what they had been before the war. By 1929, the United States was producing 40% of the world's manufactured goods. Big business in America, reported muckraking journalist Lincoln Steffens, is providing what the socialists held up as their goal. Food, shelter, clothing for all. Henry Ford pioneers a new age of mass production. The automobile industry led the new age of productivity. In 1910, U.S. automakers built fewer than 200,000 cars a year at prices that only the wealthy could afford. By 1929, at least half of all Americans' families owned a car. The credit for this transformation of the car from luxury item to consumer good goes to Detroit automaker Henry Ford. Ford's goal was to mass-produce cars in order to lower their prices. The public should always be wondering how it is possible to give so much for the money, he wrote. He accomplished his goal by designing a revolutionary moving assembly line that cut production time from 14 to 16 hours. He then could cut the price of his cars from $950 in 1908 to under $290 in 1926. When he unveiled his assembly line in 1914, Ford made a stunning announcement. He was more than doubling his workers' pay, from the $2.40 per 9-hour day common in his industry to $5 per 8-hour day. The public loved him for it. Business leaders hated him, saying that he was ruining the labor market. Looking back, historian Frederick Lewis Allen observed, What Ford had actually done in his manufacturing techniques, his deliberate price cutting, and his deliberate wage raising, was to demonstrate one of the great principles of modern industrialism. This is the principle that the more goods you produce, the less it costs to produce them. And the more people are well off, the more they can buy, thus making the lavish and economical production possible. Frederick Lewis Allen, The Big Change, 1952. Ford sold so many cars that by the mid-1920s, his Detroit, Michigan factory complex had 19 buildings covering two square miles. A new car rolled off his assembly lines every 10 seconds. By 1930, Ford had produced 20 million cars. Innovations give birth to new industries. The automobile industry's rapid expansion fueled growth in other industries, such as steel, rubber, and oil. Highway construction boomed. Restaurants and hotels sprang up along new roads to meet the needs of motorists. The popularity of cars also created new service industries, such as gas stations and repair shops. By the mid-1920s, one of every eight American workers had a job related to the auto industry. The airplane industry also boomed. During World War I, airplanes had become weapons. In 1927, the Bo Boeing Airplane Company won the U.S. Post Office contract to fly mail and passengers from Chicago to San Francisco and back. By 1930, there were 38 domestic and five international airlines operating in the United States. The airplane had been transformed from novelty to vehicle. A plastics craze also changed American life in the 1920s. Synthetic fibers like rayon revolutionized the clothing industry. See-through cellophane became the first fully flexible waterproof wrapping material. Bakelite, the first plastic that would not burn, boil, melt, or dissolve in any common solvent, was vital to the production of radios. Radio had first been used for wireless communication among ships at sea. By 1920, radio stations had sprouted up in many U.S. cities. Radio production soared as a result. By 1929, radios were a big business, with Americans spending $850 million on sets and parts that year alone. Big businesses get even bigger. Businesses were not only prospering, but also getting bigger due to a wave of consolidation. Consolidation is the merging or combining of two businesses. During the Progressive Era, antitrust laws had slowed business consolidation. Harding, Coolidge, and Hoover, in contrast, chose to ignore antitrust laws. The Republican presidents defended the consolidation on the grounds that it made the economy more efficient. Consolidation came early to the automobile industry. Before 1910, there were hundreds of companies building cars in the United States. By 1929, three automakers, Ford, General Motors, and Chrysler, built almost 90% of the cars in the market. General Motors were the brainchild of an entrepreneur named William Durant. Unlike Ford, who made just one car model, Durant offered several models at different price levels. By the end of the decade, General Motors had become the nation's leading automaker. 
The story was similar in other industries. In the 1920s, a handful of holding companies bought up nearly 5,000 small utility companies. A holding company is a corporation that owns or controls other companies by buying up their stock. By 1929, about two-thirds of American homes were wired for electricity, and consolidation led to a decline in the cost of electricity. Consolidation also revolutionized the grocery business, as the Great Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company, A&P, launched the first grocery store chain. Mom-and-pop grocery shops were driven out of business, as A&P's chain grew from fewer than 5,000 stores in 1920 to more than 15,000 by 1929. Not everyone viewed this triumph of big business as positive. An anti-chain store movement swept through a number of states and cities. Speculators aimed to get rich quick. As the good times rolled on, some Americans got caught up in get-rich-quick schemes, such as Ponzi schemes and the Florida land boom. In this Florida scheme, shady real estate developers sold lots among the Florida coast to eager speculators in other parts of the country. A speculator is someone who takes the risk of buying something in hopes of selling it for a higher price later. As long as prices were going up, no one cared that some of the lots were underwater. Prices collapsed, however, after a hurricane devastated the Florida coast. Many speculators were left with, that with nothing but near worthless land. Others saw the stock market as a road to riches. In the past, only wealthy people had owned stock. During the 1920s, stock ownership had spread to the middle class. John Raskob, a General Motors executive, encouraged stock buying in a Ladies' Home Journal article entitled, Everybody Ought to Be Rich. Raskob told his readers that if they invested a mere $15 a month in the stock market, they could expect a massive payout of $80,000 in 20 years. Many Americans took his advice. Housewives invested their pocket money in stocks. Barbers, cab drivers, and elevator operators bought stocks on hot tips they'd overheard while working. As money poured into the market, stock prices soared. The Dow Jones Industrial Average, a measure of stock prices still used today, doubled between 1928 and September 1929. Left out of the boom, enduring poverty. Between 1921 and 1929, the gross national product, GNP, of the United States rose by 40%. The GNP is a measure of the total value of goods and services produced within a country in a year. However, not all Americans shared in this prosperity. In 1929, a family of four needed $2,500 a year to live decently. More than half the families filing tax returns that year earned $1,500 or less. The 1920s were hard times for farmers, many of whom were deeply in debt after the war. Surplus crops also caused farm prices to collapse. Hard times for farmers meant even harder times for farm workers. Mexican, Mexican-American, Asian and Asian-American workers earned the lowest wages and endured the worst working and living conditions. Unskilled workers also fared poorly in the 1920s. Workers in old industry struggled to stay employed. Coal miners were laid off by the thousands as gasoline, natural gas, and electricity became more popular sources of energy. The textile industry faced heavy competition from new synthetic fabrics. Among the hardest hit were African Americans, who were often the last to be hired and the first to be fired. They were usually paid less than their white counterparts and were also barred from most unions.